Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the presentation of our nation's colors, presented by the General Colin L. Powell Leadership Academy and Junior ROTC Program. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Performing the Star Spangled Banner, please welcome Paul Metza and Willie Walker. dawn's early light what so proudly we hail as the twilight lights gleam whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watch we're so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare from bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled O'er the land and of the free and the home of the brave. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom alaikum. This is my good friend, Imam Hamdi Al Sawaf. And this is my friend, Rabbi Michael Adam Platz. In the name of God, most gracious and most merciful, the cherisher and the sustainer of the whole universe, it's really an honor to be with all of you tonight. It's really an honor to be with all of you tonight, and I repeat, as the president of the board of the Islamic Community Center of Minnesota, as an imam, spiritual leader of our mosque, Masjid al-Iman, or Mosque of Faith, and as a psychotherapist as well, I love to share with you how many of our members of our community, sorry to say, have been suffering. Our children, boys and girls, our mothers, sisters, wives, who have been wearing, especially the mothers, sisters, and wives, their hijab, their headscarf, have been suffering a lot from that Islamophobia against Muslims and against Islam. But let me assure you that it is all of us together who can struggle and strive against all of those rhetoric around us. Keep in mind that with that wonderful and historical visit by our President Obama to the Islamic Society of Baltimore when he emphasized that an attack on one faith is an attack on our faith.
And in the meantime, no wonder if we hear it over and over from our Democrat presidential candidates, Senators Clinton and Sanders, when they repeat it over and over, safety and security of Muslims in the United States of America is the safety and security of all citizens of the United States of America. That's why I'm so thankful and appreciative for that. On behalf of our community, let me assure you that we really, really appreciate what we have here, not only in addressing speech, but is in action. Thank you again. This is my brother. We are the children of Abraham. When you attack one of us, we all bleed. Muslims and Jews, Catholics and Buddhists, gays and people of color. We are all American. But bigotry is not American. Religious intolerance is not American. Racism and Islamophobia and homophobia and anti-Semitism and sexism are not American. So tonight we pray on behalf of all that is good and that is American and Minnesotan. Decency and compassion, equality, religious freedom, marriage equality. We are all building our America together. And so tonight we lift our prayers and we stand together, united, courageous, and determined to live up to the legacies of President Lincoln and Vice President Humphrey and Mondale to triumph over the petty peddlers of pessimism and despair with a power far mightier and everlasting, with love. Almighty God, most gracious and most merciful, help all of us, guide all of us to stay in solidarity, to promote peace, justice, and harmony for each and every single person in our community and abroad in the whole world. Thank you. Amen. And to my Jewish sisters and brothers, Shabbat Shalom. Give you a hug. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Democratic presidential candidate, United States Senator Bernie Sanders. Thank you. Okay. I'm going down. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It sounds like some of you are ready for a political revolution. All right. Well, let me thank you all very much uh, for giving me this opportunity uh, to say a few words. These teleprompters here are not mine. I'm going to look down. So, um, and let me let me begin by thanking all of you for doing what too few Americans do. And that is because you love your state and you love your country, you are prepared to get involved in the political process. You understand that men and women fought and died to preserve American democracy, and you are doing everything you can to make sure that we have a vibrant democracy. So thank you all very much. 
And as we were driving here, of course, my thoughts went to an old and very dear friend of mine, uh, Paul Wellstone and his wife, Sheila. Paul and I were elected uh, in 1990 at the same time. Uh, we became very close friends. We worked together on a number of issues. And I want to thank the Democrats of Minnesota for making sure that Paul's work, and more importantly, his vision, is never forgotten. Uh, everybody in this room understands that no president, not Bernie Sanders or anybody else, can alone address the enormous crises facing this country. And the reason for that, which is not talked about very much in the media or in Congress, is the reality that big money interests, Wall Street, corporate America, corporate media, Koch brothers, large campaign donors, have so much power, so much influence over the economy and political life of this country, no president can do it alone. So I can sit here for 10 hours, that's right, I can sit here for 10 hours and tell you all the things that are wrong and all the things that have to be done, but I'll be wasting your time because nothing significant gets done unless millions of people come together, including working people who have given up on the political process, young people who have never been involved in the political process, African Americans and whites and Latinos and Native Americans, Asian Americans, gay and straight, men and women, young and old. Unless we revitalize American democracy so that we have one of the highest voter turnouts in the world, not one of the lowest voter turnouts in the world. And when millions of people get involved in the political process and look at Washington and say, you know what, our government belongs to all of us, not just a handful of wealthy campaign contributors. When that happens, we transform America. So our job, the easy part of our job, is beating Republicans, and that's easy because if you look at what Republicans stand for, it is a marginal position. Very few Americans believe in the Republican program. How many people do you know think that it makes sense to give hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks to the top two-tenths of one percent and then cut Social Security Medicare and Medicaid. Well, it's not only that it's it's not only that it's not right. Very few people believe that. Republicans win elections when people become demoralized, when they give up on the political process, when they don't vote, they don't get involved, and when big money buys the elections. Republicans win when voter turnout is low, progressives and Democrats win when voter turnout is high. Our job is to create a high voter turnout. And this concept of involving people in the political process to make change, that's not a new idea. It's not a Bernie Sanders idea. It's been going on forever. Just a few minutes ago, I had the privilege of talking to some of the leaders of the trade union movement here in Minnesota. And they understand, and you all understand, that when workers came together to demand dignity, to demand, 
to sit down and collectively bargain contracts, that didn't happen because employers thought it was a great idea. That happened, that happened because working people said, you know what, we are not beasts of burden. We have rights. We want leisure time. We want safety on the job. We want to be paid a decent wage. They stood up and they fought for unions and they fought for those rights. And every worker in America owes the trade union movement an enormous amount. But it's not just the trade union movement. Does anybody here think that the civil rights movement is simply about Lyndon Baines Johnson citing the Voting Rights Act? Change always comes from the bottom on up. It comes when people stand up and say, you know what? The status quo is no longer acceptable. So for a hundred and more years, people stood up and fought, and sometimes they were lynched. Sometimes their homes were bombed. I was in Birmingham, Alabama a couple of weeks ago, and I went to that church where four beautiful children were killed because of a racist explosion. And what I learned on that day, and I didn't know this, I should have, I didn't, is there were 14 bombings in Birmingham during that month. In other words, the city was under siege by racists who were trying to terrorize people who were fighting for civil rights. But the people of Birmingham, the people throughout the South, blacks and their white allies said, sorry, segregation and racism is going to end in America. And they stood together, they marched on Washington, they sat in, and we made huge, huge breakthroughs. But it happened not because of somebody on top, it happened because millions of people essentially said, enough is enough. And what about the women's movement? 100, 150 years ago, women saying, sorry, we are not going to be treated as third-class citizens. We are going to do the work we want to do. We are going to be able to vote. We are going to be able to run for political office. Huge, terrible, enormous struggles. But women, as a result of those efforts, made enormous progress. Environmental movement didn't happen in Washington by some senator introducing legislation. It happened because people saying, what is going on on this precious planet of ours? You can't destroy it. We've got to protect the planet. And you think about something like gay rights. If we were sitting here 10 years ago, 10 years ago, and somebody said, you know, I think that in 2015, Gay marriage will be legal in 50 states in America. The person next to him would have said, what are you smoking? Which raises another issue. But the point is that when people at the grassroots start moving and when they say, this is not right. You know, in this country, people should have the right to love anyone they want, regardless of their gender. You, tremendous changes took place. And now, you go and you talk to young people, as I do, and you talk about gay marriage, they shrug their shoulders and they say, what's the big deal? That's what a revolution is about.
And if we were here 30, 40 years ago, somebody jumped up and said, you know, I think that America is mature enough, it has gone far enough in overcoming racism, that in 2008 we're going to elect an African-American as President of the United States. Forty years ago, very few people would have believed that could happen. But it did happen. And what happened is, and it doesn't matter whether people like Obama or whether they don't, what they said is we're going to vote for somebody based on his ideas, not the color of his skin. A revolutionary breakthrough. Well, here we are in 2016. And for a start, what every person in this room knows, although apparently our Republican friends do not know, is that this country economically has come a very long way under President Obama and Vice President Biden in the last seven years. Now, we shouldn't be too hard on our Republican friends because they suffer from a very serious illness called amnesia. They just can't remember where we were seven years ago when we were losing 800,000 jobs a month, when we were running up a record-breaking deficit of $1.4 trillion, and when, oh, by the way, the world's financial system was on the verge of collapse. Other than that, we were in pretty good shape when Bush left office. Well, we have come a long way in seven years, and we should be proud of the accomplishments of the Obama and Biden administration. But we have got to be honest and to acknowledge we still have a very, very long way to go to create the nation that I know all of us believe we can create. Now, I've been all over this country talking literally to hundreds of thousands of people. Nobody I know, nobody I have talked to, thinks that it is acceptable, thinks that it is moral, thinks that it is sustainable, that in the United States of America, we have more income and wealth inequality than any other major country on Earth, and that it is worse here today than in 19, since 1928. That is not acceptable. It is not acceptable to me that the top one-tenth of one percent owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. It is not acceptable to me that the 20 wealthiest people in this country own more wealth than the bottom 150 million Americans. It is not acceptable that one family, Walton family of Walmart, owns more wealth than the bottom 40 percent of the American people. And when we talk about the economy, it's not just wealth, it is income. In my state of Vermont, and I'm sure in Minnesota, we have many, many people, millions throughout our country, who are working not one job, but two jobs and three jobs, trying to cobble together the income that they need and maybe some health care. And yet, despite the hard work of the American people, and we are the hardest working people of any people in the industrialized world, we work the longest hours. Despite all of that, 58% of all new income generated today goes to the top 1%. My friends, this is not an American economy. It is not a fair economy. It is a rigged economy, and together we are going to change that.
But it's not only a rigged economy where the people on top are doing phenomenally well while the middle class continues to disappear and 47 million Americans live in poverty. What you have accompanying the rigged economy is a corrupt campaign finance system that is undermining American democracy. Now, I wish I could give you a gentler word, a less harsh word, but the word is corrupt. The word is corrupt because what we are seeing today is Wall Street and billionaires spending unlimited sums of money into super PACs attempting to elect candidates who will represent their interests. So let me tell you as straightforwardly as I can. Number one, I am proud that I am the only Democratic candidate running for president who does not have a super PAC. Number two, our campaign has received, and I never in a million years would have believed this to be possible, up until this point in the campaign, we have received three and a half million individual contributions, averaging $27 apiece. This is a campaign, to paraphrase Abraham Lincoln, of the people, by the people, and for the people. And let me tell you something else. If anybody here does not understand the direct connection between a corrupt campaign finance system and the major issues facing our country and what Congress does do or does not do, does not understand anything about contemporary American politics. So let me be as straightforward as I can and tell you that one of the first major priorities of a Sanders administration will be to overturn this disastrous Citizens United Supreme Court decision. Now, our campaign talks about the need to reform a corrupt campaign finance system. We talk about the need to end a rigged economy and create an economy that works for all of us, not just the 1%. And we talk about a broken criminal justice system, a criminal justice system in which we have more people in jail than any other country on earth, largely black and Latino, and Native, and Native Americans. <laughs> Let me tell you very briefly a story that kind of encapsulates everything that we talk about in this campaign and what a rigged economy and a corrupt campaign finance system and a broken criminal justice system is about. Some of you may have read in the last few weeks that large Wall Street financial institutions like Goldman Sachs have reached a settlement with the United States government. In the case of Goldman Sachs, it was for $5 billion. Other banks have reached even larger settlements with the government. And obviously, the reason that they are reaching these settlements is because they were selling subprime mortgage packages to investors and to the American people that were worthless. So they reached a $5 billion agreement with the U.S. government. That's point number one. That to a significant degree, the business model of Wall Street happens to be fraud. Point number two, when we talk about political power in America, 
where the average American says, why should I vote? I got one vote. Koch brothers are going to spend $900 million. Wall Street spending all this money. No one hears my pain. No one is concerned about my life. I'm not getting involved in this charade. Don't ask me to vote. And I'll tell you one of the things that really angers the American people is that today some kid in Minnesota will get picked up for possessing marijuana. He or she will get a police record which will stay with him for the rest of their lives. But executives on Wall Street whose greed and recklessness and illegal behavior ended up driving millions of people out of their homes, out of their jobs, and out of their life savings. Not one of those executives on Wall Street will have a police record. That is not what criminal justice is supposed to be about. A Sanders administration will bring back justice to a criminal justice system. Whether you're rich or you're poor, you will get equal treatment under the law. And when we talk about the issues facing the American people, when we understand why it is that people are working so many hours for such low wages, it should be clear to every person in this room that we have got to raise the minimum wage to a living wage, 15 bucks an hour. And when we talk about equitable wages, I hope that every man in this room will stand with the women in the fight for pay equity for women workers. <clears throat> now, I know I will not shock any person in this room by telling you that every now and then, once in a while, there is a bit of hypocrisy in politics. I know you're all very shocked, dismayed to hear this, but it's true. And let me give you an example of the ultimate, I think, in hypocrisy. My Republican colleagues go all over this country and they say, we hate the government. Government is the worst thing. It is terrible. It is awful. We're going to get the government out of your backs. That's why we're going to cut Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. We'll do away with the EPA. We'll cut nutrition programs for hungry kids. Government stinks. We're going to get it out of your lives. Except when it comes to a woman's right to choose. In that case, my Republican colleagues love state and federal government and want the government to make that decision for every woman in Minnesota and in America. I will do everything in my power as President of the United States to beat back those attacks on a woman's right to choose. And when Republicans talk about family values, what they are also saying is that every gay person in this country should not have the right to get married. I disagree. We live, as everybody here knows, in a highly competitive global economy. 100, 150 years ago, workers in this country achieved a huge, huge breakthrough. 
And what they managed to accomplish, which we take for granted right now, is public education. They said, we don't want our kids who are six or seven or 10 to be working in factories or on farms. We want them, like the rich kids, to be able to get a decent education. And they fought and succeeded in creating great public schools all over America. This is the year 2016. And in my view, it is time to rethink public education and to understand that in many respects, a college degree today is the equivalent of what a high school degree was 50 years ago. That is why I believe that when we talk about public education, we should demand that every public college and university in America be tuition free. And the other part of that equation in terms of higher education, and this is really quite unbelievable, if you are prepared to think outside of the box, outside of the status quo, all over this country, and I'm sure in this room here, you have people dealing with incredibly oppressive loads of student debt. And I'm talking about people paying $50,000, $100,000, $400,000 of student debt, which they will be paying off for decades. I keep running into families where mom is not only paying off her daughter's student debt, she's paying off her own student debt of 20 years ago. In America, we should not be punishing people for the crime of trying to get an education. We should be rewarding people, encouraging people to get that education. And that is why I believe that we should allow people with student debt to refinance their loans at the lowest possible interest rates they can find. Now, some of my opponents and some of the corporate media says, well, you know, Bernie, you're just, you know, you're giving out all this free stuff. You're Santa Claus. You're a wonderful guy. How are you going to pay for it? You've got to be sensible. How are you going to pay for this idea? I will tell you how we're going to pay for free tuition in public colleges and universities and lowering student debt. We're going to impose a tax on Wall Street speculation. When Wall Street crashed, and I was there in the Senate, Wall Street went begging to the American people and to the U.S. Congress, bail us out, bail us out. Well, Congress did. Now it is Wall Street's turn to help the middle class of this country. When we talk about a corrupt campaign finance system, there are many, many examples that I could give you about how campaign finance impacts public policy. Probably the most, the easiest one would be to deal with climate change. I am a member of the Senate Environmental Committee and the Senate Energy Committee, and I've talked to scientists all over the world. The debate is over. Climate change is real. It is caused by human activity, and it is already causing devastating problems in our country and around the world. And as president, as president, I would lead this country, working with China and Russia and India and countries all over the world, to take on the fossil fuel industry, to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy.
Now, here's the point. Here's the point that I want to make. How does it happen? In this sense, I, I, I'm being as deadly serious as I can. How does it happen if the entire or virtually the entire scientific community agrees that climate change is real and is causing devastating problems and will only get much, much worse in years to come? How does it happen that we have a Republican Party which almost unanimously, few exceptions, rejects science? How does it happen that not one Republican in a debate or in any other format will come up and say what everybody knows to be true? Climate change is real, and we have to transform our energy system in order to save this planet for future generations. How does it happen? Not one candidate, Republican candidate for president will say that. And the answer is that on the day that Republican candidate says it, he will lose his campaign funding from the Koch brothers, from ExxonMobil, and the fossil fuel industry. That is what a corrupt campaign finance system is doing to this country. In my view, we judge a nation, and I know that Paul Wellstone said it better than I, but we judge a nation not by the number of millionaires and billionaires we have, but by how we treat the most vulnerable people in our country, people who cannot defend themselves. That is the sign of a great country. Nobody in this room should be proud of the fact that we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of almost any major country on earth. And nobody should be proud or accept that millions of seniors and disabled veterans are trying to get by on $11,000, $13,000 a year. That is not what America should be about. And that is why I believe that we must lift the cap on taxable income coming into the Social Security Trust Fund and expand Social Security benefits. My legislation, legislation that I've introduced, would raise taxable taxes for people earning 250,000 or more, top one and a half percent, and expand and extend Social Security. Extend it for another 58 years and expand it such that seniors now living on less than 16,000 would get $1,300 a year more. That is the least that we can do for the people who help build our country and raise us. My friends, people say that my vision for America, my ideas are just too radical. They're not radical. The only thing that is radical is the fact that the insurance companies and the drug companies and the fossil fuel industry and Wall Street and the military-industrial complex, they are standing in opposition to what we have to accomplish. So it's not a question, I think, of what we should be doing. I believe and have always believed my entire adult life that health care is a right of all people, not a privilege. I'm on the committee that wrote the Affordable Care Act. We made some real progress, but we can do better. So the issue in front of us in this campaign is not what we know we should do. There is widespread agreement on that. It is whether or not we have the courage to stand up to the billionaire class, to stand up to Wall Street, 
to stand up to the drug companies and the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies and all of those people today who are exercising enormous power at the expense of ordinary Americans. What the, what the political revolution is about is the belief that yes, when we stand together, when we do not allow the Trumps of the world to divide us up, yeah, there is nothing that we cannot accomplish. I ask you to join the political revolution. Thank you all very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Democratic presidential candidate, Secretary Hillary Clinton. This is my fight song. Take back my life song. Prove I'm a right song. Hello, Minnesota. <laughs> It is wonderful to be here, reunited with so many friends, supporting the DFL in a state with such a long, proud, progressive tradition. Now, so many Minnesotans have inspired us with principled leadership. Hubert Humphrey, Walter Mondale, and the late, great Paul Wellstone. I had the great honor of serving with Paul and Sheila and spending a lot of time on the floor of the Senate talking with him about what we wanted to see happen to improve the lives of the people we represented. And I've thought a lot about him in the last months. He was a true progressive who wanted to get things done who wanted to make progress, and I miss him, and I thank you for sending him to serve. Now, adding to that list, there are many of you here tonight. Someone else I served with spent a lot of time sitting in the back row as first-term senators as your terrific governor, Mark Dayton. There's a lot to be said about Mark, but you know how effective he's been, how he has stood against the tide of Tea Party Republicanism, and how Minnesota, under his leadership, has the highest job growth record in the United States. But knowing Mark, that's not enough. He wants now to focus on what can be done to create more jobs in places that are not yet seeing that kind of economic growth. From the Iron Rage to communities of color, Mark is determined that he's going to make progress everywhere in your state. I want to thank his terrific Lieutenant Governor, Tina Smith. And I want to thank my two friends and former colleagues, your two senators, Amy Klobuchar and Al Franken. You know what treasures they are because you get to see them all the time, but they're actually working their hearts out, stumping across the country for me. Everywhere they go, people are just blown away. They want to know more about them. They want to know what they can do to try to elect progressive senators like them. Amy and Al are great friends, and they're even better public servants. To mayors Chris Coleman and Betsy Hodges, to the members of Congress representing you, all the state and city officials who pour 
your hearts into serving the people of Minnesota and our country every day. I thank you. Now, we've come together at an important moment. When I started this campaign last April, I knew we were facing challenges as a country. Talking to families across America has made it even clearer to me. It is appalling to encounter the indifference and neglect that I saw firsthand when I went to Flint last Sunday. Those children and their families have been poisoned with lead in their water because their governor wanted to save money. When I meet with a home health aide in Nevada who's been taking care of other people's loved ones for 40 years and learn she has never earned enough to put away even one penny for her own retirement, there's something wrong. It's also wrong that the cashier I met in New Hampshire is paid less than her son for doing the same job at the same company where she's actually worked longer. And I'll tell you what else is wrong. It's wrong that American companies play legal tricks to sell themselves on paper to companies overseas to avoid paying their fair share of taxes here at home. Now, the most egregious example of that is a company from Wisconsin called Johnson Controls. Johnson Controls makes auto parts. When the economy crashed in 2008, they, along with the auto companies, came to Washington asking for help. In fact, they went from office to office. The Republicans' response was, let the whole auto industry die. Take all those millions of jobs and all those communities and let them just die. President Obama and the Democrats in Congress listened, constructed a program to help, provide financial support to the companies and the suppliers and others, and it worked. It worked so well that those companies paid back the U.S. Treasury ahead of time. So what's happened in the last month? Johnson Controls announced they're turning their back on America. They're pretending to sell themselves to a company in Europe. They're pretending to move their headquarters. They're moving their profits to Ireland in order to avoid paying taxes to the government and the people that helped them in their time of need that kept their company going. That, my friends, is called an inversion in the tax law. I call it a perversion, and together we are going to shut down those abuses when I get into office. There's no wonder. No wonder people are angry. They have every reason to be. But they're also hungry. They're hungry for solutions they can count on. Now, we've heard a lot about Washington and Wall Street in this campaign. I want to get secret, unaccountable money out of politics as much as anyone, in fact, probably more than most. A little-known fact, Citizens United was about a right-wing attack on me, one of many over the years, to try to undermine and push back the views and values that I've espoused. On the first day of my campaign, I said, 
We are going to overturn Citizens United. We will use Supreme Court appointments, and if necessary, I will lead a constitutional amendment to get control back over the financing of political campaigns. I've also made it clear we can't let Wall Street threaten Main Street again. No bank should be too big to fail, no executive too powerful to jail. And we have the authority now to do that. Thanks to President Obama, your senators and others, the toughest regulations on Wall Street since the 1930s were passed in the Dodd-Frank bill that gives the government the authority to go after any bank that poses a systemic risk. So that's available. It has to be used, if appropriate, and I will use it. But I want you to understand this. After we do everything we can to get control again over the financial industry, get control again over campaign finance, we can't stop there. We need to get jobs growing and incomes rising. Too many Americans can't find a good paying job, no matter how hard they try. People haven't had a raise in 15, 16 years. We need a bold national mission to create millions of jobs in clean energy, manufacturing, and infrastructure. We need to deal with high college costs and student debt. They're holding so many young people back from starting their lives. And yes, we need to create more jobs for young people because being out of work at the start of your career can have lifelong repercussions. Now, earlier today, in South Carolina, I shared my plan to help move more than 36,000 unemployed young people here in Minnesota and across the country in numbers pegged to each state. Because it's not enough just to be against things. Yes, that's important. But America, we are the nation that gets things done, that charts the future, that makes a difference in the lives of the people of this country. We need an agenda to unleash the innovation of our entrepreneurs and small businesses. So we have to tackle the economy. We have to tackle the barriers economically that stand in the way of people getting ahead. But there are other barriers holding Americans back too. African-American families who face discrimination generation after generation have just a fraction of the wealth of white families. They get denied a mortgage three times as often. They face other challenges in health and education. That's a barrier. That's a barrier that stands in the way of their dreams and aspirations. Having $11,000 in wealth compared to $141,000 for the median white household is an indictment, but also a reflection of the deeply entrenched discrimination that is faced. Think about the crisis of so many young black people dying after encounters with police like Jamar Clark, shot and killed a few months ago, not far from where we sit tonight. Think about immigrant families lying awake at night, listening for a knock on the door in the United States of America, working in the shadows 
vulnerable to exploitation by unscrupulous employers. Think about all the women in our country still fighting for equal pay, still struggling to get access to reproductive care, while Americans go after Planned Parenthood again and again. Think of all the new parents struggling to take care of that newborn baby or maybe a sick relative when their job doesn't offer paid leave. I want to applaud Governor Dayton for his proposal for paid parental leave here in this state. It's the right thing to do, and we've got to do it across our nation. Talk about schools and low-income communities like the one I visited in South Carolina today. They're part of what's called the corridor of shame along I-95. Schools that are crumbling and decrepit, that don't have the resources, the teachers to help young people get the best possible education. I was very moved by the letter that several of you signed last week asking the White House to allocate more funds for schools that educate Native American kids right here in Minnesota. If I am so fortunate as to become your president, I will be your partner every single day in working with you to serve all of Minnesota's children. Now, all of us know, don't we? Don't we know that we need real solutions to the challenges we face? I'm running to tear down all the barriers that hold people back across our country. And I am not making promises I can't keep. Every once in a while, a day comes along when we make something big and extraordinary happen all at once. But in my experience, that's not how we make change most of the time. To make change happen over and over again, you've got to keep working at it. You have to keep fighting for it day after day. And if you get knocked down, you get right back up. I remember back in the early 90s, I was working day and night to pass universal health care. You know, before it was called Obamacare, it was called Hillary Care. And we faced a lot of the same obstacles and criticism. You know, the drug companies and the insurance companies went right at us, went right at me. We didn't get what we wanted. Yes, we were knocked down and we were set back. But by then, I had traveled across America. I had met countless Americans who had been denied health care coverage. They didn't have enough money. They had a pre-existing condition. They hit a lifetime limit. I remember being in the children's hospital in Cleveland, talking to a group of parents with very sick children. And they were telling me what it was like to have a child who needed a lot of medical care and not be able to guarantee that they could have that provided. One father said, you know, I'm a successful businessman. I actually run a business. I provide health care to my employees and their families. But I can't get health care for my two daughters who have cystic fibrosis. He said, I go from insurance company to insurance company, and I tell them I can pay something 
Give me what I can pay for, please. And the answer is always the same, no. I said, what do they tell you? He said, you know, the last meeting I had, I was talking to the agent making the same case that I've made so many times before. And he looked at me and he said, you don't understand. We don't insure burning houses. And this man looked at me with tears in his eyes and he said, they called my little girls burning houses. I couldn't get that and other stories out of my mind. And when we didn't get everything we wanted, when we got knocked down, I said, look, we got to figure out how we make progress as much as possible. So I got to work with Democrats and Republicans to find common ground, to provide health care to the most vulnerable among us, our children. We were able to pass the Children's Health Insurance Program, which now is a lifeline for 8 million kids across America. I never gave up on the dream of universal health care, not for a second. And 8 million kids, as great as it was, wasn't everything we wanted. But it was real. It was achievable. It made a profound difference. And I couldn't bear the thought that we would leave children without health care even a single day longer than we had to. That's why I was thrilled when President Obama passed and signed into law the Affordable Care Act. That has been a goal of the Democratic Party since Harry Truman. And it is helping so many people right now. We have 90% coverage, 10% short of universal coverage. No more denials because of pre-existing conditions. Young people up to the age of 26 can be on their parents' policies. Women no longer pay more for our insurance than men. And no more lifetime limits. So yes, I'm going to defend it. I know how hard it was to accomplish. I want to improve it, get the cost down, make sure we get to 100% coverage, and do everything I can to rein in prescription drug costs by going right at the drug companies, requiring them to negotiate for lower prices with Medicare, and going after predatory pricing, which we have seen in the last months results in price increases of four, five thousand percent overnight. I learned from my family and my faith to try to do all the good you can, as long as you can, for as many people as you can. When you see people hurting or being treated unjustly and you think you can help them, maybe make their lives better, you've got to do it, especially when you're someone who's had blessings, who, yes, who's been knocked down but able to get back up. That's why I say with all my heart, we're going to build on the Affordable Care Act. We're not going to start over. We're not plunging this country in some contentious national debate where we'd have to go from 0% to 100%. We're going to take on those drug companies. We're going to take on those costs. And we are finally going to achieve universal coverage. So yes, we're going to do all of that. Because so many people and families depend on us doing that. That is the path forward, not a divisive debate about the shape of what could be done, a whole system that will stop us in our tracks, create gridlock, 
and not move us forward. Here's my promise to all of you. I will work harder than anyone actually to make changes that improve lives. Together we will build on the progress we've made under President Obama to break all the barriers that hold Americans back. I was very honored after running a hard campaign against then Senator Obama to be asked to serve as his Secretary of State. The trust that he placed in me the opportunity that we had to work together on behalf of our foreign policy and national security was an enormous privilege. And I had a front row seat in watching him do what needed to be done in responding to the financial crisis. I don't think he gets the credit he deserves for saving our economy from the horrible ditch that the Republicans drove us into in 2008. I think he's shown great presidential leadership in dealing with the implacable opposition of the right wing and the Republicans and the Tea Party. I think millions of Americans are better off because of his presidency. So I, yes, will build on the progress he's made because I am a progressive who actually likes to make progress. You know, those of us who are grandparents know the older you get, funnily enough, the more you start thinking about the future. So imagine with me at tomorrow where hard work is honored and rewarded with rising incomes, where we produce enough renewable energy to power every home in America and create millions of good jobs doing it, where education lifts you up and student debt doesn't drag you down, where more entrepreneurs can start and grow new small businesses, Imagine a tomorrow where every American knows that, no matter what their race or religion or sexual orientation or gender identity, they'll have an equal shot at achieving their dreams because this is their country too. Imagine a tomorrow where gun violence no longer stalks our country and elected officials stand up to the gun lobby, not get intimidated. Imagine a tomorrow where America is safe at home and strong in the world. That's the tomorrow we want for our children and our grandchildren and for our country. So when you go to caucus on March 1st, I hope you will ask yourself, who can you count on to break down every barrier, not just some? And think about this. Think about this as you go. Yes, Wall Street and big financial interests, along with drug companies, insurance companies, Big oil all have too much influence, and I will fight every single day to even the odds. But even if we were able to get rid of all of that undue influence tomorrow, we would still have the cruel negligence we saw in Flint. We would still have the kind of anti-Muslim demagoguery that we have seen in this campaign and which must end. We would still have discrimination in so many forms. We would still have powerful voices denying climate change, opposing every single common sense gun safety reform. And we would still have Republican ideologues ripping the heart out of the American middle class with their attacks on workers' rights the right to organize, to stand up, to be part of a union for better wages and working conditions. 
My friends, I am not a single-issue candidate, and this is not a single-issue country. We need a president who can do all parts of the job on behalf of all Americans, who believes in the basic proposition about our country, that when each and every American has the chance to live up to their own God-given potential, then and only then can America live up to its potential. With your help, we can build that future together. Please join me on March 1st. Thank you all for everything you are doing to make sure we move with confidence and optimism into the future that we shape. Thank you all very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending the Humphrey Mondale Dinner. Good night.